can everyone see this? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah. So I'm here to present Trace Sigma. Um, this is a, a team effort um, by Team Better. So you can check out our website. There's nothing much right now. You know, it's really a placeholder. Um, and I want to talk a bit about like our journey and some technical in depth on like our design decisions and how we, you know, how we came about wanting to do this. So um, just to talk a bit about better, uh, it is a. I just created this team like about a few months ago. Um, it's a bunch of people who come together and we decide that we want to actually build open source projects. Um, to actually like uh, open source projects which are well engineered, right? Um, so a bit about our team. Our goal is to build open source projects with good engineering practices, which means that we have uh, proper design and planning, code reviews, um, continuous integration, you know, and continuous testing. Of course, not everything is implemented at the moment, but you know, I often draw um, like lessons from my past experience. Uh, or even as my, uh, so, uh, yeah, don't worry about the screen translation because of the uh, different aspect ratio. Yeah, um, yeah. So as, as, my, as my experience as a software engineer, um, okay, the team has a couple of people. It, it is pretty distributed. Like I think uh, three three people are in Singapore. Um, the first three are in Singapore, and the last three are here in the US. Okay, um, we. Our goal for Trace Sigma is to really to build a open source reference hardware to aid standalone contact tracing applications. For example, like um, today when we want to do contact tracing on a standalone piece of hardware, there are not many designs out there, you know, where you can just take and modify. Um, you know, they, they probably have different goals as well. So the direction we um, approach this is that we want people around the world, okay, to be able to easily source components. Later, you'll see why uh, easy sourcing of components is important. It has to be easily reproducible, right? So, you know, we talk about having uh, a 3D printer or um, some simple molding facilities. You should be able to create the mechanical case, for example. Um, by extensibility, we sacrifice size, it is not particularly tiny, you know, but it also has a lot of capability, especially when we choose to use the ESP32 platform, right? It's not a particularly power uh, energy efficient platform, but it does come with a lot more compute resources. Okay. Initially, um, so this is our goal for, for Trace Sigma, right? The V0 version is a kind of like looks like a pager, um, you know, the goals, the design goals were to have it purely self-contained, no mobile app is, should be required, right? It should be like a belt clip where let's say someone who is working in uh, healthcare or construction could just like clip it on the belt and go about doing their work, right? Um, you know, it has a decent runtime of about seven days, right? Definitely we wouldn't uh, we won't have a great runtime of, let's say, uh, in five or six months, right, of the trace we are token. Uh, but we, early seven days is pretty, uh, is, is a good goal for a start. Data retention, 21 days. The benefit here is that we actually have, like, Wi-Fi and optional GPS. And, you know, by being completely compatible with OpenTrace and the ability to have custom apps and add-ons, it really gives the users a lot of freedom to like extend this to their own use cases, right? For example, if let's say we want to have this device, um, let's say, I, I don't know, like uh, someone who needs to log temperatures of let's say staff at an entrance, right? You know, this could be embedded with a NCR module and it becomes uh, you know, a handheld temperature logging device, right? So we started back in, I think, around April 
or so, you know, I was talking to a couple of friends uh, who were working on Trace Together, the app, you know, and, and there was about the time when they were proposing that, hey, you know, iOS had these issues of, uh, you know, being able to keep the app in the foreground. How a solution was, um, is potentially would solve that problem. Now I was looking around and I basically saw this device called the M5 Stick C and I was pretty like, intrigued like it has like so many things squeezed in a small form factor and it only costs 10 bucks right the downside is that that device has like almost no battery i think it has, it has like an 80 milliamp hour uh battery in it but yeah it's as good as nothing so we uh it, it, there's basically some add-ons sold by the company now i was evaluating this all right i have one on my table over here as well and i, I was thinking hey this could work there's a 2000 milliamp hour lipo cell in there, right? And so I, I was, it looks like a stick, right? So I call it a tray stick. Um, but after like some brief evaluation, I talked to some friends, right? They're saying, hey, this is kind of large, you know, could we do better, right? And I agree that we potentially could, you know, have something more integrated. There's actually a lot of airspace within this uh, off the shelf prototype. So, you know, I wanted to increase the battery runtime, right? By increasing the battery runtime, it means that we can beacon at a more frequent rate, a frequent rate. Okay, so uh, version 0.2 here basically uses pouch cells. It's closer to the 3D rendered model model over here. Um, downside is that you know, when I was sourcing pouch cells, I came to realize that it is not that readily available. Like people don't sell this you know, on eBay a lot. You try to purchase from China, they'll say, hey, you need to buy like this many units, right? Um, and second thing is that it has wires. So it's really not that ideal you know, in terms of like trying to integrate everything. And if you think about the assembly line, right? Uh, having like wires over here wouldn't be very good. Yeah. Right. Um, so point three that I have not uh, exactly um, completed the mechanical design will basically use the 21700 cell, 5,000 milliamp hours. It only costs a couple of bucks. And the main reason why, like this is a, a sweet spot for uh, LiPo cells, okay, in general is that these cells are actually used in EVs, for example, like Tesla vehicle. Um, they use thousands of 21700 cells I'm not sure today, but in the past they did, right? And they also use in many other equipment, you know, like um, your um, battery power tools, etc. Right? And they're really easily sourced, um, you know. And the power density is really a lot better than the pouch cells or even your supposedly common, uh, I think, 18650 cell, right? Yeah, these actually have 18650 kind of cap out around like 2,000, 2,005 milliamp hours. So this basically gives like double the amount of energy um, with a like a two millimeter, a three millimeter increase in length. Yeah. So you know potentially I could improve on the previous iteration by wrapping a case around this. Right. And looking in future, right? Of course we can't put we can't possibly um I mean having a M5 stick C based design is great, but you know we could also improve on this right by having an a purely custom PCB because like you can see the I did a brief teardown of the M5 stick C right. There are many unrequired components in there. There's like microphone, there's like IR transmitter, you know, and we don't really need all those things. We we really want to keep the screen. And the OLED screen is great, um, and we want to be able to increase the uh, flash from like 4 meg to like 16 meg, right? And the current design, you can see users like for their two layer PCB, we could potentially shrink th shrink it down a lot into uh, like a four layer PCB as well. Yeah. And without the external orange case, orange is a really ugly color, but you know, we work with what we have, right? Yeah. So let me talk a bit about the software architecture as well. So unlike many other um, hobby projects out there. We set out to engineer this well from a software point of view, right? Which means layers, layers and more layers and modules, right? We 
use the Arduino ESP32 instead of the IDF because it's just a bit more accessible to um, the maker community. Okay, we um, implement the OpenTrace V2 BLE uh, in there, and the we have like three tasks running. Right there's there's like a uh, little uh, what do you call that uh, real time uh, RTOS system in there. Um, we have specific uh, tasks specific tasks to run the user interface and the command line interface loops. And on top of this, custom applications could actually write on top of the user interface loop to, for example, I could implement a step counter. Someone else could implement Pokemon or Digimon, right? Th those like uh, simple games in the early days. Yeah. And the over here, we will take a look at like the all the various modules we have, well, if you look at the code base, you'll be able to see like it's kind of like arranged in this manner, right? We have the UI uh, finite state machine. We have OpenTrace V2 implemented in C++. It wasn't fun converting uh, Kotlin. Kotlin is their Android um, implementation of OpenTrace yeah, into C++. Mm, you know, power state machine basically allows us to have like different power states, which I'll describe later. IO, you know, handling event-driven, interrupt-driven buttons and screen. Storage is pretty interesting. Um, we have like four or two megabytes of accessible flash for custom data, for example, like the uh, encounters, right? Yeah. So the command line interface here, we sought out to design it to be, to support automation because our test drivers will be using the command line interface to customize the device to run tests, to run commands like say, I don't know, probably like uh, activate Wi-Fi or something like that, right? So having a command line interface over serial is useful not only for automation, but also for potentially, you know, administrators or technical users could configure it for their non-technical friends or users. Extensibility, which means that custom applications can just add commands in there. This uses the ESP32 command line framework, so extending this is not tedious. The user interface, you know, this actually has a RGB OLED screen, but I don't really care about that at the moment, right? What I really like about this screen is that it, I can turn it off. I can turn it off. I can dim it. So we actually implemented all of those on our initial version. In the low power mode, you know, if the user chooses to turn on the screen, it turns off automatically. You know, you could have uh, custom brightness levels as well, right? Because it, I think there's like seven levels of brightness they can choose from. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also the user interface has we we do like uh, event driven refresh, so. You know, if there's no animation, if there's no action, no compute power is spent refreshing, re, re, redrawing the screen. Yeah. Um, in terms of storage, now I kind of like underestimated this part on my end. Like initially when I saw it out, you know, I was thinking like, hey, storing encounters, let's say, you know, if I walk past another guy with a trace together app on the phone, I, I thought that storing encounters is easier. People were just talking about like, hey, just, just like log all the messages in flash and you realize that is stupidly inefficient right so we is inefficient not only in terms of space but also in terms of um, write cycles now flash has a limited number of write cycles you don't want to write every single thing you hear on radio so we have to cache okay so we are we took it we take a look at the right side over here when we appear up here is basically like an encounter First level of cache basically holds it purely in memory. Um, and the, we define a encounter right as anything, any peer we observe for more than five minutes. So which means that we drop encounters which are less than five minutes consecutively. Um, and if the peer is observed for more than five minutes, we'll actually put it in the second level cache, which creates a mapping on flash Right. Um, you look at the code, there's a, uh, like a two level mapping of like temp IDs to, uh, Luther, I thought it was 15 minutes. Yeah. 
Oh, right, it is 15 minutes, sorry. Yeah, uh, I just go through this really quickly. Yeah, uh, it has like different levels of cache. Um, in terms of power states, you know, um, I have multiple power states in order to conserve energy. Um, in terms of battery, we try we try to optimize the uh, cell life by capping the uh, maximum and minimum voltage they operate within. Yeah, um, I also have uh, plan to set up like a test farm where like, we'll get up with GitHub to basically do uh, CI CD over here. In terms of beaconing, the key differences is that we scan really often, at least once a minute, but we transmit um, every two seconds. We may increase the uh, transmit frequency. So what happens is that we can actually um, observe clients more uh, in a more timely manner. Yeah. Uh, any questions from the public? Lots. <laughs> Hi. Um, starting right at the end, uh, you're talking about five seconds every 600 uh, that's a le uh, to listen. That's less yeah. than 1%. Have you done modeling on likelihood of an encounter being detected? For with like a two second yeah. level of interval of transmission? Yeah. Um, not, not really, not really. I mean, by base. Oh, sorry, I miss, I miss, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I misread. Uh, no, see, you got that wrong. Uh, the token is ten seconds of every three hundred. Still uh, lower sorry. than what you're doing, but yeah, it's a three percent duty cycle. Sorry, uh -huh. I misread your thing. But uh, that, that was the token, not the, not your product. So the the tracing of the token is ten seconds of every three hundred. It transmits every half second. Yes. Oh, okay. So it's ten seconds can every. Uh... Five minutes every, or every five minutes, yeah. What, what oh. I'm asking is, um, so you are transmitting a quarter as frequently, but you're scanning for ten times as much of the time. Have you modelled the likelihood of an encounter being detected by Bluetooth? Mm, not really. Um, I mean, I purely, I purely did like tabletop tests. I have like five devices over here. Yeah. There's a lot more technical okay. details into it, including like uh, the overhead time because the trace together V2 protocol is pretty time inefficient where you need to do like connections and exchange. Yeah, so so oh, those... thank you, pardon. It's V2. Yeah. So the other issue is that the TT token doesn't use V2. It's a separate protocol. But yeah. That, okay. Yeah. And it's, sorry, that actually answered the question. You can't possibly do what the the token is doing if you're doing the whole of V2. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I will read the rest on your website. Like, we're obviously out of time. Yep. Any more questions, interests? So, so, so what are the limitation of, of your system? Uh, not limitation, but kind of what is the weakest point of, of those gadgets? Because uh, um, you are developing it as a as a gadget. For people to develop, right? Uh, but all these, all these, um, all these stack and and and, and the display, etc., um, and even having an SP32 in there is actually over-engineered. No, I mean this is my, I, I, I see it as an over-engineered solution. Um, if uh, it, it all depends on the angle, I mean I understand it. You know, it's like a maker kind of push to develop those kind of gadget but if uh, first of all I haven't read the open if you go back to your slot to your slides already the the protocol I, I haven't read how how quick uh, a communication can be with this uh, trace uh, app or something like that so I, 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 I don't know the kind of um, aspects but I, I always felt like even when I, I look at those uh, um, like Roland, you know the, the 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 hacker the hacker session when when you open all this stuff. The, uh, is it are these gadgets not over engineered, even as a as a real minimum? The issue here is to have a piece of electronics that scan whatever is close to you. Like like Roland say, is this what is the the probability that if I go from here to work and come back? Uh, do I do I stay two seconds 
uh, you know, within a certain distance of someone else, does that event must be captured, or is the likelihood of of not catch, you know, not 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 catching that from that person or something, is actually minimum? Uh, and then afterwards, I, I, when I look at those those uh, those things, is that if I have a gadget, I mean a gadget, I call it a gadget as as a system, is that uh, every day I can plug it when I come back home anyway. So um, it, it's a bit like, you know, uh, for me, all of this is over-engineered for, for the task. But yeah, it really depends it, what your use case is. I yeah, agree yeah. that there is a lot of features. Um, the goal is that you know, we actually start with a superset so that when we want to trim it down, it would be much easier. Because over mm -hmm. here, we are we're not really going with like the minimum capable, uh, minimum possible product. Right. For example, like Trace Token is an example of like a minimum uh, design product which has like minimum possible features. Of course, the battery life would be a lot more. I'm actually trying to stick as close to the original uh, Open Trace protocol um, as possible, purely because it's open, um, and uh, basically allow people to customize what they want. For example, like if you don't want a screen, you don't need many features. You could remove those hardware components. You could remove those code. Does the in the stack you, you mentioned this uh, porting something in C plus plus for the that microcontroller? Is that that stack is actually very very uh, complicated, or, or is it uh, the open open trace v v two? Is is it like? Uh, maybe I need to read so some of these. Uh, the, the protocol is BlueTrace. OpenTrace is the uh, the open source version of the app. Uh, BlueTrace is about as simple as it's possible to do, uh, so long as you are connection oriented. It's nothing more than the exchange of capability information. So the two mm. devices, one 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 is a central one decrypter, one detects the other, and they change roles all the time unless they're iPhone. Um, as soon as they decide to connect, the you get a one capability message each way that contains all of the information required for the epidemiological use case, and that's it, they disconnect. There's nothing else involved. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, the big challenge, but it's, uh, sorry, I know this is James' presentation, but it, a, I looked at this closely and I was blindsided by what GovTech had actually done. The big problem with Blue Trace is that an adversary can control your power use which means that the battery life becomes a target for denial of service. What the tokens changed is that an adversary cannot control your battery use. The token uses exactly the same amount of battery if it's in a Faraday cage or if it's in a, ro a room with 10,000 people. It's exactly the same amount of power consumption. So there's a, there's a very different threat model uh, if you do or don't have a rechargeable battery. But there's, a, there's then also a huge usability thing. Right? The, the elderly people who don't use phones or small children can't be relied upon to recharge their devices. So the, the two protocols are both very minimal, but they, they solve different problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by, by sticking to the OpenTrace V2 um, protocol, that's why we have Wi-Fi to be able to like communicate to get the temp IDs and like transmit the encounters, that sort of thing. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, uh, just one, one question. One, oh, sorry. Um, have, have you considered, uh, is there a need for encryption uh, when the when two deep devices are com communicating between each other? Well, the OpenTrace V2 uh, protocol didn't call for encryption, um, but encryption is, po is possible on this device. So actually, two devices are close to each other, one receive and one emit, or something like that, and then suddenly they they capture the, the some tag or some signature from another one. So we assume that that signature or that message has to be. Uh, 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 sorry, sorry. Oh, we are running uh, way over oh. time here. Can you okay, can yeah. please leave your questions to after the session? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. So next up, also fighting the good fight again.